30 or 90 people, but we're far above this, aren't we? Thank you all so much for coming. It shows just how important the topic is. I'd like to welcome everybody here. The, on behalf of Salmonarm Kairos, the Shoe Swap Environmental Action Society, and Shoe Swap in Transition, which are the local hosts. When we heard that two organizations were going to arrange a tour, the Dr. Vier, Dr. Vrain, we were very excited about this. One of them is the Society for a GE3DC, and the other one is Greenpeace Vancouver. So we were really thrilled when we had a chance to to see Dr. Brain coming here, <coughs> and we know he's got some a lot, a lot to say that's of real value, because he can talk about the research that's been done, the recent research on GMOs. He's not just telling us what somebody has heard or picked up from a friend. And this is the genuine article. First of all, I'd like to call on Dr. Hugh Tyson to introduce our guest. Also introduce the Reverend Lynn Elliott, who's going to be moderator of the discussion afterwards. If you haven't met Lynn yet, this is your chance to. So I'll pass over to yeah. you then to tell you a little bit about our speaker and his remarkable credentials. Thanks, Ray. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Thierry Bain here today in the United Church. He's a former Agriculture Canada lead researcher involved with the scientific technology that's been applied to modifying some of the major food plants in North America, for example, corn, canola, and soybeans. We probably all heard of genes, genetic engineering, genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. And we probably all heard of DNA and its role as the blueprint for every living organism. From Dr. Brain's own experience, he's able to give us an informed picture of the biotechnologies industry's use of transferring and inserting genes from one species to another. And give us also a perspective on where this application to the food that we eat every day, something that we all take an intense interest in, where this application is going to lead. Dr. Brainberg began his 30-year career with Agriculture Canada as a soil biologist working with nematodes, or roundworms. The problems of identifying these tiny soil-borne plant pests led him to the newly emerging techniques of isolating and sequencing the DNA from living organisms. He retrained himself as a molecular bio a geneticist and is thus a very familiar with the application of DNA technology to transferring genes from one organism to another. Now retired, he's re-examined the biotech industry's creation of genetically modified organisms given today's really exciting and updated understanding of, and essentially rewriting of, modern genetics. That is the study of heredity or how characteristics are inherited. Genetics and inheritance are now profoundly more complex than it seemed when DNA and its role in heredity was first unraveled some 50 years ago. He's alarmed by the number of scientific studies out of Europe which are raising many concerns about the long-term safety of genetically engineered foods. And that makes it important to listen to his views today. I think this approach echoes something that was said a very long time ago. And here's a quote. I wish to propose for your favorable consideration a doctrine which may, I fear, appear wildly paradoxical and subversive. The doctrine in question is this, that it is undesirable to believe a proposition when there is no ground whatever for supposing it be true. That's a quote a long time ago from Bertrand Russell, 1935, on the value of skepticism. <coughs> and it's just as valuable today to apply skepticism. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. 
it's just as valuable today to apply skepticism to the claims of food safety made by the biotech industry. And so with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Brain to take over. So I usually introduce the topic with this slide, saying that basically the gene revolution is a tale of two molecules. You're all familiar with the double helix. I'm going to talk about DNA. Of course, this is about genetic engineering. But I'm also going to talk about the small molecule. And the small molecule is glycine methylphosphonate. The chemical name has been shortened to glyphosate, which is the active ingredient of the herbicide Roundup. And the herbicide Roundup is the most successful chemical molecule ever so far. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk for about an hour, perhaps a few more minutes, but I'm going to explain to you what GMOs are. Is there a way we could turn off the light? Uh, maybe in the central eye or something so the slides show better on the screen. And how they are created, that's gonna be not even technical. <coughs> what, they do, what the technology delivers. Basically, I'm going to review the premises, the promises of the biotech industry that the technology uh, was invented to reduce pesticides use, that they increase yield. You've all heard that we need the technology to feed the world, etc. And that they are completely safe to the environment and of course very, very safe to eat. And then I'm going to talk about Roundup. So what are GMOs? Well, there's a lot of confusion because you hear about golden rice you hear about the uh, engineered papaya, you hear about the future crops coming, drought tolerance and soil tolerance, and that's the future, and I, quite frankly, uh, I doubt very much that it's coming, for technical reasons. GMOs today, the reality of GMOs today, genetically modified organism on planet Earth, is that 90% of all engineered plants today are tolerant of Roundup. 90% of all engineered crops today are engineered to resist the herbicide Roundup. <coughs> so really, the whole thing is about selling a chemical. So we have the HT stands for herbicide tolerant. That's how we design the tree. And so we have Roundup ready corn, we have Roundup ready soybean, we have cotton, canola, uh, potatoes, wheat, all the major crops have been engineered to tolerate the herbicide, to resist the herbicide. And it's a fantastic technology. It's, it's, it's perfect for the farmers. The, it's been incredibly successful. And I will explain to you, if you uh, in a minute. There is another small trait, another trait that is also used with the technology. Sometimes they're stacked, they come together, sometimes not. But it's really only 10 to 15% of engineered plants, engineered crops that are resistant uh, to insects, and it's called Bt. Bt stands for, it's the name of a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis. The bacteria was discovered 100 years ago in Japan. The Japanese silkworm industry were basically dying. There was some contamination and nobody could figure it out and it is a German microbiologist who solved the puzzle, discovered the bacteria, and named it Bacillus thuringiensis, Thuringia is a region of Germany. So we have two traits, and that's it. Practically 100% of all engineered plants on the planet have one of those two traits. The rest, particularly golden rice, is distraction. The HT trait, meaning the plants are engineered to tolerate the herbicide, meaning the farmers don't have to worry about their weeds anymore. Weed management becomes incredibly easy. Don't worry about your weeds. Imagine if you're gardeners, don't worry about your weeds. You just plant your seeds. Never mind the weeds, even if they're tall. And then when your seeds come up, you just spray. And all your weeds disappear. It's magic and the farmers love it. 
And if the weeds, a few more weeds come back, you can spray again because your crop is completely resistant to the herbicide. And the Bt trait is a resistance to insects. <coughs> the bacteria makes a protein when it's sporulates, it creates a it makes a crystal protein, a protein. And that protein is incredibly toxic to insects. And so there is a whole family of bacteria, and they all make different proteins. And there's a bacteria that makes protein that are toxic to caterpillars. And there are bacteria that make a protein that are toxic to beetles, and then maybe some other insects. And there's a whole series of bacteria that make proteins like this and we don't know what they are about. We don't know what they're toxic to. We haven't discovered that yet. This bacteria is very common in the environment. There is no denying that the technology has been incredibly <coughs> successful. It has taken agriculture by storm. Over the first um, crops to be engineered appeared in 1996. This is the bottom left of the curve. And in 15 years, most of those crops now are like 90%, over 90% of soil is engineered. Almost 90% of corn is engineered. Over 90% of canola is engineered. 100% of sugar beet is engineered, etc., etc. It's an incredible success for the chemical industry. That's what GMOs are. How are they created? There are two ways to create a a genetically engineered plant, GMO. The first one is to use a bacteria. This bacteria is called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It is a common bacteria also. It's in the environment. If you go wander in the woods and you see some thimble berries, sometimes you'll see some growth on the stems of the thimble berries, some tumors. This bacteria, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, causes little tumors on the plant. The disease is called crown gall. <coughs> This is the original genetic, genetic engineer. This bacteria has learned to insert its genes into the plant. It does what bacteria do with each other. Bacteria do with each other what is called lateral gene transfer, which is what <coughs> genetic engineering is about. And it is very different from vertical gene transfer, and I'm going to explain. Lateral gene transfer goes like this. Imagine that in this room, we are all bacteria. And I have mutated one of my genes. It's a normal evolution. I have mutated one of my genes. I have a new protein. I can do this really interesting, nifty trick with my protein, and nobody else can do it. And you're all looking at me, and you say, are you going to share? And I say, well, of course, here. Let me sit down next to you, and I pass you. I pass my genes to you. This is what bacteria do. They stand next to each other, and they give each other genes. They are very promiscuous. It's very normal. It's called lateral <laughs> gene transfer. That's when you pass your genes next to the, the person next to you. Vertical gene transfer is what plants and animals do. They don't do lateral gene transfer. Vertical gene transfer is what plants and animals do. It's called sex. You get your genes from your parents, and you give your genes to your children. You don't give your genes to the person sitting next to you. You can't do that. But only bacteria can do that, and only genetic engineer can do that. So when you hear that, you know, we've been modifying plants for 10,000 years, and we've been modifying DNA for... Don't be confused, there's no relationship. This bacteria transfers its gene to the plant and it swims in the soil, it comes to the plant, the plant is talking, saying, I'm a plant, I'm a plant, and the bacteria says, okay, okay, I'm coming. And it comes to the plant and as it arrives to the, next to the plant, there is a, a plasmid. Bacteria have, don't have a nucleus, Bacteria have a big chromosome, and they have tiny little chromosomes called plasmids, little circular things that you see on the screen, called plasmids. And there is DNA there. 
and all the genetic information for the parasitic association of this bacteria to the plant is on one plasmid, which we call the TI plasmid, tumor-inducing plasmid. And as soon as the bacteria comes to the plant, this plasmid is activated and it makes proteins. There's a region of that plasmid that makes different proteins. And proteins are enzymes. Proteins are the molecules that do the work in the cells. And so these proteins, some of these proteins, there are a dozen of different kinds of proteins there, which we call virulence proteins. Some of these proteins make a copy of another region of DNA on that plasmid called the transfer DNA. And they take that transfer DNA and they pull it across the bacterial cytoplasm and all the way inside the plant and into the nucleus of the plant cell. And then they make a cut into a chromosome of a plant cell and they put the gene, the bacterial gene, into the, plant, into the chromosome of the plant. Now that plant cell is now engineered by the bacteria. It's very natural. And the bacteria says, feed me. And the plant cell must do what it's, been, it's told because now it is engineered to do what it's told. And the plant cell is now making opines, bacterial sugars for the bacteria. And those sugars do not exist in the plant kingdom. It is engineered. So if you're a genetic engineering and you study this and you see how that works, oh, it's easy. You say, okay, I can cut in the bacteria, I can remove the tDNA, and I can put in there what I want, a gene, the gene that I want to put in the plant. Could be anything. It could be a gene from a fish or a gene from a tomato or a gene from a human being. The technology works very well to transform plants to make human protein. It's called farming, P-H-A-R, farming, like pharmacy. And it is happening today. It's much cheaper to make human proteins that way, like insulin or lysozyme or what have you, in a, a thousand acre of corn, rather than to do it in a big fermenting bath. Anyway, that's a parenthesis. Back to our bacteria. I'm a genetic engineer. I've just put the gene of interest into, into, into the, the, the TI plasmid. And then I just put the bacteria next to the plant. And it does what it does. And it transfers the genes. And now the plant is, the cell is engineered to do what I want. It's not a very efficient process. So, when you do that, you do that with single cells on a petri dish, and you put the bacteria next to the single cells of the, the single plant cells, and you have to find out which ones have been engineered because you've got a million cells in your dish, and a few will have been engineered in your experiment, and now you need to find the successful event, the successfully engineered cells. And to do that, you use what is call, called a marker gene. So next to the gene that you want to insert into the plant, into the plant cell, you put another gene. There's a few other pieces, but we don't need to go into that. And you put another gene called a marker gene, and normally it is an antibiotic resistance gene from a bacteria. You know, you all know that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. So antibiotic resistance genes are easy to find. So you've got the gene that you want, the gene for antibiotic resistance, and then you have them into the plant via the bacteria. And now you put your cells into a petri dish with the antibiotic. And the antibiotic will kill the plant cells, except for the ones that have the antibiotic resistance gene, with the gene of interest. Now you take those cells, and you put them on another petri dish, and you can grow them back into a whole plant. <coughs> There's another technology to do this. It's called a gene gun. It looks like a hair dryer. You're shooting millions of very tiny pellets, almost microscopic, some metal that does not oxidize, like gold or platinum, and you glue it onto those pellets the gene that you want with the antibiotic resistance gene, and you shoot. 
and some of the pellets, the plant tissue is going to be spread with those pellets, and some of those pellets are going to end up into the nucleus of a plant cell. And by some process that we don't know how it works, the genes will migrate and be integrated into a chromosome of the plant cell, at random, of course. So now you have a plant cell that has both genes, very much the same as what the bacteria did. And you plate them onto a petri dish with antibiotic and the successful, successfully genetically engineered plant uh, cells will survive and every, all the other cells will die. Then you take those cells and you grow them back into a whole plant. The, the engineered cells are basically treated like stem cells or embryonic cells. You regenerate a whole plant. Every cell of that plant contains the genes, both genes, the gene that you want and the antibody resistance gene. And then you can multiply that plant. You can make, today we have about 450 million acres of engineered plants. All of them contain an antibiotic resistance gene. This is how engineered plants are created. So what do they deliver? <coughs> well, let's look at the first one. They are the technology uh, will reduce pesticide. Some of you are, have investments, I'm sure. You, some of you look comf comfortable, wealthy. You have investments. Imagine that you are an investor in a large chemical company, and you know there's a, a, me a, me a meeting of all investors, and the company brings a team of engineers in front of you who say, we have, this, we have created this amazing technology. We are going to reduce our sales by 50%. And the investors look at the engineers and are you crazy? Of course not. Of course not. The industry knew very well that this was not going to happen. And it has not happened. The engineering technology is very successful. The BT trade, like I said, 90% of 450 million acres, you can do the math. That's a lot of sales of Roundup all over the world, particularly in North America. So not only have we not reduced the sales, the spread and sales of herbicide, but they've been shooting through the roof for the last 15 years. To be true, there has been, for the, last, for the first few years after 1996, when the uh, first crops were uh, commercialized, the BT technology has reduced somewhat the sale of insecticide because the whole plant contains the BT protein that makes the plant resistant to the insects. And so you don't need to spray because when the insects come to feed on the plant, they die. So there was a reduction of sales of insecticide for a few years. And then the insects did what insects do, what biology always does, the insects learn to become resistant to the technology. And they did. So that a few years later today, now the growers are told to spray insecticide on their genetically engineered crops, even though the crop are supposed to protect them from insects. The technology is failing. The, B, the HT trait is also failing. We have now what we call super weeds in North America and all over the world. We, in North America, we have over 40 species of weeds that have become resistant to the technology. Roundup does not kill them anymore. And so for the last few years, the growers, seeing that weed control is not perfect, come back and spray some more. Well, it's still not perfect, so they come back and they spray double strength. More pesticide, more herbicide sprayed. And now it's really not working at all. In some areas, half of the acreage of the USA is now infested 
with one or more of those weeds. And we have them in Ontario, in Manitoba, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and there is absolutely no reason to think. We don't have them in BC yet, but believe me, they're coming. It's biology. Any scientist, any biologist would have told you that in 1996 when we commercialized those crops. And of course, the industry has known this was coming. And they have had years to prepare. And so now we have the next technology. We have the next generation. And so the growers, instead of using Roundup and using Roundup ready crop, well, they are going to use another herbicide so now we have corn and soy resistant to 2,4-D. And 2,4-D has a history of being toxic. 2,4-D causes <laughs> Parkinson's disease. And as we have Roundup all over the landscape, now we are soon going to have 2,4-D all over the landscape. 2,4-D was Agent Orange in Vietnam. So, no, there is no redu reduction of pesticide. But they increase yield, don't they? Well, no, they don't. There is no reason to imagine that the engineered crops with the HT trait, herbicide tolerance, or even the BT trait for insect control could increase yield because yield is a very complex trait. You need hundreds of genes to interact with each other to increase yield. And this is what we do when we do normal breeding, but not using this technology. This technology is great at inserting an extra gene or two or a handful of them, but not hundreds. There is no increase in yield. This curve here, difficult to read of course, this curve is very recent. It is a compilation of data from Europe and North America. And it compares the yield of corn all over Europe, on average, for the last 20 years, to the yields of corn all over North America for the last 20 years. And 20 years ago, the yields in Europe were lower than in North America. And 20 years later today, the yields of corn in Europe are higher than in North America and they do not use the technology in Europe. The technology does not increase yield. This publication is 2009, and in it, it contains the data of studies done by several universities in the US, showing that the engineering process is costly to the plant, physiologically speaking. There is a yield drag. Yes, because the plants are engineered, they just don't yield as much. And the farmers know that, and the farmers are willing for convenience to forego a little bit of yield for the convenience of having good weed control. There is no increase in yield. GMOs do not impact the environment. I'm just going to address two, two things. There are several things that I could mention, but just two. The first one is called gene flow, also known as contamination. If you are organic growers or conventional growers, and I have on my farm engineered corn, and you're growing corn next to me or not very far, the pollen from my field, from my engineered plant, will fly onto yours. Some of your plants are going to be pollinated with engineered pollen. And some of your grain will now be engineered, contaminated. If you are an organic grower and you get enough contamination, you are going to lose your certification. And if you want to use your seeds to replant for next year, the plants that, the seeds that are engineered will give you an engineered plant. And if you are not very lucky, Monsanto will come after you because you stole their technology. And many, many hundreds of growers in the USA have had to face the music because of this serious problem. 
they have been sued. And the organic growers in the U.S. are really, really upset with the corporation because of this problem. We have launched our canola market to Europe and the flax market to Europe, hundreds of millions of dollars, because of this problem. A lot of people are incredibly upset because now alfalfa is registered to be commercialized, engineered. And a lot of organic growers are going to lose their certification, and we grow a lot of alfalfa in Canada. Wheat was engineered 18 years ago or so, but not commercialized in Canada. And now I hear there's a push to register it for commercialization in Canada. And we are, in Canada, is one of the biggest grain growers in the world and exporters. And if we have engineered wheat, we are going to lose our markets, Asian markets and the uh, European markets for sure. So, gene flow contamination. The next problem with the environment I call genetic pollution. And genetic pollution is about lateral gene transfer again. It's what bacteria do. So if engineered plants are basically decaying on the ground, the bacteria in the soil are perfectly capable of picking up bacterial genes from the plant. Remember, we've inserted bacterial genes into the plant. And these are bacterial genes. Bacteria do that. They exchange genes and pick it up. Even from dead bacteria, they can. And so this is very normal. This is very common and doable. And then there is another problem, a little bit more personal, is that if you eat genetically engineered plants, then bacterial genes are in your body. And it has been shown that the DNA can be in your intestine before it is fully digested. And if it is, then the bacteria in your intestine can pick up those genes. <coughs> I'm taking you to China. A year ago, Sichuan University published a study where the Chinese scientists sampled their rivers, surveyed their <coughs> rivers, looking for antibiotic resistant bacteria in their rivers. We don't do that kind of experiment, that kind of study in North America. They found antibiotic resistant bacteria in every river in the sample. And the gene for antibiotic resistance was a synthetic gene. It came from a lab or from the local genetically engineered crops. We don't know. But basically, there is a certain risk of having antibiotic every cell of every plant. 450 million acres of them contain antibiotic resistance gene. And the medical establishment is incredibly worried. Everybody should be incredibly worried that we are going to lose, we are losing antibiotics because of the spread of antibiotic resistance. And so far, until now, we have thought that, oh, well, it's because it's the, uh, the animal that we raise in the barn. We give them antibiotic every day because they're so stressed. They need 80% of all antibiotics we use in North America are for the animals raised for meat. And now there is this. And the last one is about food safety. And the story starts with the concept of substantial equivalence. <coughs> substantial equivalence is a term invented by the biotech industry in the early 1990s to basically get around the law. And substantial equivalence goes like this. I'm a chemical company, a biotech company. I have invented, created a new variety of corn. And I want to go to the patent office and get a patent so that I can be protected. So, I, you know, it's mine. 
And if you go to the patent office, you have to show and prove and demonstrate that your invention is unique. There is nothing else like it on Earth. So I go to the patent office and I say, I have this new variety of corn and it is unique. It has a new gene, it has a new protein, and there is nothing like it on Earth. And I get a patent. And then the next day I go to the regulatory agencies in the USA or in Canada. And I say, I have this new variety of corn and it is, like, it, it, it is corn, it looks like corn, and it grows like corn, and it tastes like corn, and it is substantially equivalent because it's very much like all the other varieties. And because it is substantially equivalent, I do not need to test it. And none of the engineered crops have ever been tested by the regulatory agencies in the USA or in Canada. And if you write to Ottawa, to inquire about this, about the safety of your food, you're going to get a form letter telling you that there is an incredibly complex and lengthy assessment process. That's the word they use, assessment. That's paperwork. No testing has ever been done. The only testing that has ever been done has been paid by the biotech industry. The biotech industry gives a great deal of money, we're talking billions of dollars, to academia. And the academics, the scientists on the payroll, churn out studies after studies showing that indeed it is safe. One of the flaws, and probably the, one of the major flaws with this technology as it is applied in agriculture, is that it is based on lateral gene transfer, and it is based on the one gene, one protein hypothesis. 30 years ago, when the technology was invented, the dogma, the paradigm in science was one gene codes for one protein. It's the one gene, one protein hypothesis, which was put forward 60 years ago after Watson and Crick described the DNA. And, and which means that basically the genome is a collection of coding sequences for genes. About 5% of the genome codes for proteins. And then there's 95% of the rest of the genome. And when I was a graduate student, we had no clue as to what it was about. It was just full of long, long repeats. Doesn't mean anything. It's junk DNA. So we have 5% of DNA coding for genes, coding for proteins, and 95% of junk DNA. That's what I learned when I was in graduate school, and that's what I was working with when I was in the field. 10 years ago, at the completion of the Human Genome Project, that's when things changed, that's when our knowledge evolved. We learned at the completion of the Human Genome Project that we have about 21,000 genes as a human being. But everybody agrees that we function as a human being with about 100,000 different proteins. And you cannot make 100,000 proteins with 21,000 genes with our picture of the genomes as we had it before. So what we learned in the last 10 years is really about these incredibly long repeats of DNA. The junk DNA is actually a series of incredibly sophisticated and sensitive regulatory sequences that basically tell the genes how to play with each other to make proteins. There is no more one gene, one protein. It does not work like that. So what we have is the genome as an incredibly sensitive ecosystem. And when you come with your big gun and you shoot pellets into the system, you're going to create collateral damage. And when you shoot gene construct, the, the two genes that I mentioned, and you just shoot them somewhere in there, somewhere at random in the genome, we have no control, then what the result is that you're going to create, the, the genes are basically going to kind of not really know what they're doing or what they should be doing, and you're going to create a lot of many new 
proteins that do not normally exist before your experiment. And those proteins are often truncated, malformed, mutated. And some of them have no activity and some of them will have enzymatic activity and they could be allergenic or toxic or dangerous. <coughs> Engineered, this is out of Belgium. Engineered corn, soybean and canola all have those new proteins different from what the biotech industry reports. Because the regulatory agencies and the biotech industry don't want to hear about that. They don't want to know. Forty-three proteins in engineered corn plants were significantly disrupted compared to non-GE plants. The bold is the name of the scientific journal the articles are published in. And in 1996, just before the first crops were commercialized, the toxicologist, the scientist of the Food and Drug Administration, the Food and Drug Administration in the USA are the gatekeepers. They are there to, to test, to do those tests. They test new molecules, they test new processors, new <coughs> proteins to make sure they're safe before they are released. <coughs> and those scientists all agreed and went to warn their director that these new engineered crops would contain new proteins, rogue protein, variant protein, truncated proteins, and some of them would be allergenic or toxic or create other problems. The director of the Food Administration went over the head of his scientists, over the opinion, completely ignored them and registered the crops without any testing. The director of the Food and Drug Administration at the time was Mr. Michael Taylor. He had been a lawyer for Monsanto. He was put in place as head of the FDA by the White House. And soon after the registrations were done, he went back to Monsanto as vice president. And a few years ago, he came back to the FDA to make sure the corporation is properly treated. This is called a revolving door policy. It's it's public knowledge, it's well known. <coughs> and so what we have is, on the one hand, mostly in North America, we have a lot of studies paid for by the biotech industry telling us that it's perfectly safe. And then we have a lot of studies done, mostly in Europe and in other countries in the world, Russia, uh, China, Japan, Brazil, uh, showing that there is really a lot of concern because there is organ damage in lab animals and allergenicity, allergic proteins. And so we have lots of papers have been published on this. Scandinavian Journal of Immunology, the Bt proteins are basically allergenic. So this, the Bt protein has been shown to be allergenic to mammals. Immune response to Bt proteins, BT current causes anaphylactic shock, and this is leukemia caused by BT proteins. And then there is the other <coughs> proteins also that are toxic and basically cause organ damage in the rats. Mice-fed engineered, or oh, mice, mice-fed engineered soy have damaged liver. Mice-fed engineered soy have damaged testicles, uterus, and ovaries. I'm just going to give you two more because those two publications have a bit of a story to them. The first one is published in 1999 out of uh, Scotland in one of the most prestigious medical journal in the world, The Lancet. The picture is the intestinal lining of the rats fed engineered potatoes, the, 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 they were labeled precancerous. They were organ damage, there were many, many organs affected. So much so that the scientists decided to abort the environment, the, uh, the experiment. <coughs> he had been given a large grant by the European Union to do, to put, he was one of their 
you know, best toxicologist in the world. And he had been given a large grant so that he had a big lab and he was putting together a protocol of research to test genetically engineered crops. This is like a year, not even a year after the first crops were commercialized in the US. Europe knew that they were coming and they were going to have to test them. They were not going to accept them without testing. And so they asked this uh, professor uh, to design the protocol of research and after a few months he was very alarmed and he said there is no need to go any further. Uh, the rats are uh, too damaged and he went public with the agreement of his research director, he went public about it to warn the public, to warn the government. There were phone calls between Washington and London and Prime Minister Tony Blair called the Royal Institute in Scotland and said, fire him, gag order, confiscate his papers, close his lab, disband his team. And that was done the next day. There was a big scandal in the science community in Europe. He was given his papers back a few months later and promptly published in one of the best medical journals in the world. So you can be sure that this paper was heavily reviewed and peer reviewed. <coughs> that was the first alarm bell that was in 1998, in the summer of 1998, published in 1999. The next paper, the last paper that I'm going to show you was published a year ago in France, uh, out of a lab in France where I did my undergrad in Normandy. And there's a bit of story to this paper as well. It has been completely refused by the biotech science community. It, it, it makes them crazy. The story goes like this. When Monsanto came to France to commercialize their crop, the French government said, well, yes, but you need to do some testing. And so, yes, they did a test, and they had rats and the protocol of research, and that was agreed upon, and they fed their rats for three months their engineered corn from Monsanto. And after three months, the data was analyzed, and the statistical analysis showed that there was no, nothing happened. The rats were perfectly happy. And one of the scientists in France was a bit intrigued because he had some preliminary evidence of damage, plus what I just showed you before. So he asked to see the data, and he was refused. This is patented, you know, this is top secret. So he went to court to get the data, and because it's France, not the USA, he did obtain the data <laughs> from the experiment and reanalyzed it and showed significant differences between the treatments showing that there were clues, there were signs of organ damage after three months. And he showed his results, his new analysis, to the regulatory agency in France and to the Monsanto. And they both said, oh, yeah, but that's biologically irrelevant. There is no such terminology in science. They made it up. If you do an experiment, and you do a statistical analysis, and you get significant differences before, between treatments, that's a clue that there's something going on. There is no such thing as biologically irrelevant. So this scientist decided to repeat the study. He repeated the study that Monsanto had done. He, he took the same strain of rats, the same protocol, the same everything, except he decided to examine the rats for two years instead of three months. So he fed the rats for two years instead of three months. And he also had an extra treatment where he was tested. He was testing the rats feeding on engineered corn from Monsanto with or without Roundup, which had not been done by Monsanto. He just wanted to see if Roundup was safe. Well, after three months, there were basically some clues that there was something wrong. After four months, the rats had clear organ damage, and a few more months, and the male and the female came down with uh, mammary tumors. And some of you must have seen those pictures because they really went on the internet. 
which makes the biotech industry crazy. The same day after publication, the biotech science community, the corporate science community, I call it the biotech bubble sometimes, went completely nuts. The many scientists came and, and criticized our study heavily. It was, it's never been done before like this. It's like, it's like you don't know what you're doing. This is, this is you know, a mature uh, scientist. Um, you chose the, the wrong strain of rat. <laughs> You, your statistical analysis stinks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so he has responded to all the critics, making the point that since it is the same protocol and the same rats, if his study is not valid, then Monsanto's study is not valid. And a year after publication, oh, the reviewers of the, the paper, because the paper was peer reviewed, of course, uh, the reviewers of the paper were pressured to change their opinion. The editor of the journal was pressured to retract the paper. And a few months later, sometime last spring, a, editor, a new editor came onto the board, the editorial board of the journal, a man who was working for Monsanto, and a few months later, and that's, I'm talking two days ago, this is <coughs> fresh. Two days ago, the paper was retracted. One full year after it was published. This has never happened in the, in the history of science. Just to give you a hint of the power of the corporation. I think I'll stop here. This is how safe it is to eat. And now I'm going to talk about Randall. Was there a difference from the Roundup to the just genetically engineered? Uh, I think it's better for the <coughs> you can Apologies. ask me that question. I'll take questions afterwards. You remember when I started, I said 90% of engineered plants are engineered to resist the herbicide Roundup. <coughs> this is the weed management strategy that the farmers love. So Roundup is a herbicide, it's it become incredibly common. And the little molecule on the top right is glyphosate, the active ingredient of Roundup. Now Roundup contains nasty molecules, other than that, but I don't have time to go into that. I'm just going to talk about glyphosate, the active ingredient. Glyphosate was invented in 1964 as a chelating agent. A chelating agent, a chelator, is a molecule that grabs onto metal ions. That's what it does. That's what it's designed to do. When you go to your doctor and your doctor says, you're pale, I'm going to do some blood work. And you come back and says, you know, you're a little bit anemic. I'm going to give you some iron supplements. Because in your blood, there is a very important molecule called hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin is a protein, and in the center of the protein, there is a metal ion, it's iron. So imagine that you have in your blood residues of a chelating agent, like glyphosate, competing for the iron with your hemoglobin. You're in trouble. This is a very strong, a broad-spectrum chelator. And a, broad, and a strong broad-spectrum chelator like this is very good if you want to clean up water of, met of toxic metals or industrial processes, but not in your food. So Roundup, the herbicide, or glyphosate, they, they basically go together, and they go together with all the engineered plants. If any engineered ingredient in the food store is contains residues of Roundup. Glyphosate as a chelating agent, many enzymes are impaired because most of our proteins to function need a metal ion, be it iron, cobalt, manganese, what have you. And, and glyphosate can compete with all these proteins for the metal ions. Glyphosate is a broad spectrum herbicide 
and it was patented as such in just before 1970, and Monsanto bought the patent and made history, because it is the most successful molecule. But glyphosate was also patented a few years ago as an antibiotic. And an antibiotic is very good if you use it to cure of a microbial infection, but an antibiotic in your food is not necessarily very good. And so we know that glyphosate is toxic to fish. Again, because it is a chelating agent, because it, it impairs a lot of enzymes. It is toxic and even teratogenic. We've known that for a long time. Teratogenic to amphibians and many other vertebrates. And we've learned recently that <coughs> glyphosate, Roundup, is antibiotic and it kills bacteria particularly the beneficial bacteria in the guts of animals. We are not the only animals with bacteria in our guts. Every animal on the planet has bacteria in their gut. <coughs> and Roundup is very noxious. And this experiment was done not too long ago. Effects of glyphosate on the enzymatic activity of the liver and the intestine in the rat. And it was found that glyphosate impairs a family of enzymes called the cytochrome P450. And the cytochrome P450 do all kinds of very basic essential processes in, in living cells, including human cells. <coughs> and they, that <coughs> inhibition would explain many of the symptoms that we saw in rats, like gastrointestinal disorders, or kidney and liver damage and infertility. This has all been shown experimentally. And when I say gastrointestinal disorder, I don't mean tummy ache. I mean autoimmune disease. I mean celiac and Crohn and leaky guts. Very serious stuff. And there is a paper that was published a year ago by two biochemists from, the, uh, from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and one of them had been studying, has been studying autism for many years. And she is very, she is very concerned because she says, you know, 20 years ago, autism was about one in 10,000. One in 10,000 kids was on the autistic spectrum. Today, it's one in 50 in North America. She is concerned. She says, it has to be an environmental factor. It is in the water, in the food, or in the air. And so when this paper was published, she went back to the literature to look into what the inhibition of this family of enzymes could cause to human beings. And of course, what happened in the rats, we can also have that. But she added to the list an obesity, depression, autism, Alzheimer's. Glyphosate, Roundup, the herbicide, is antibiotic and it kills the bacteria in your gut. We know that autistic children have a very low uh, number of bacteria in their gut. They, they, instead of having 100 billion, they have much, much less than that. We've known that. And they have all kinds of other physiological symptoms, of course. It's not just in their head. These bacteria in our gut are so important that now there is a name for them. It's, it's, it's like an organ, it's like another organ, just as important as your brain or your liver. It's called a microbiome. And those bacteria are responsible for your happiness. They make 90% of the serotonin that goes to your brain. They help you digest. They make vitamins. They make essential amino acids and many other processes, essential processes. The biotech industry is very prompt to say, well, millions of people have eaten trillions of meals in the last 15, 18 years, and nobody has ever fallen ill. And this is the most empty statement I have ever heard. There is no scientific anything to it. There is no science studies. There is no follow-up. 
there is no way of knowing who is eating what. And what we have, and this was published, it's not peer-reviewed and it is not a scientific studies, but a doctor, in, a medical doctor in Seattle, published two or three months ago a series of graphs that she plotted, she got the data from the Center for Disease Control, the CDC in Atlanta, to how many cases of autism in 1995 and in 2000 and in 2012. And she plotted the data to the volume of sales of glyphosate in North America, in the US actually, in the USA, in those years. That's also publicly available. And this is the kind of curve she gets. And the curve starts climbing in mid-1990s, basically, when the, commercial, the first crops were commercialized and glyphosate took off. And, and I could show you 20 of those curves because she has them in her publication. This was for autism. This is the number of hospitalization for acute kidney injury plotted against glyphosate applied to corn and soy in the USA. And again, the curve starts climbing in the mid-1990s. These are called correlation studies. And I find them extremely alarming. And many, many doctors also do that. And we don't have that, this is very fresh, and we don't have those numbers yet in Canada or in Europe. What I found was this on the net. Children diagnosed with celiac disease at Alberta's Children's Hospital. And again, the curve starts climbing in the mid-1990s when GMO canola became very prevalent all over Alberta. So what we have here is basically the future. And the future has Roundup and engineered crops. And we know that Roundup causes nutrient deficiencies. It's a chelating agent. We know that Roundup is an antibiotic. We know that there is a serious problem with super weed with Roundup and that we are on a chemical treadmill onto the next technology and the next herbicide, which is more toxic. And we know that engineered crops do not yield more. And we know that there is a serious problem with gene flow and contamination and genetic pollution. And we have allergenic, allergenicity, allergenic proteins and toxic proteins. And that's what the future looks like. So a lot of people ask me, well, what can we do? <coughs> and I say, there's not a lot you can do. You can educate yourself. You can learn what food is in the store that might be contaminated with the herbicide or engineered, and if it is engineered, it contains the herbicide. <coughs> and so basically what I say is, well, you look at the vegetables. And I'm not saying they're not spread with anything, I'm just saying <coughs> the vegetables are not engineered. <coughs> None of the vegetables are engineered, except for sweet corn. We seem to be the um, guinea pigs here in Canada because sweet corn is not yet in the US, but it is in all over Canada now for the last two years. So none of the vegetables but sweet corn. None of the fruit is engineered, except for papaya from Hawaii. And then you look at the meat and the dairy. And all the animals are fed engineered corn and soy that have been sprayed with Roundup by definition. And then you look at the bread and the grain products. And even though the grains in Canada have not been engineered, they are sprayed with Roundup three days before harvest. Because that's the convenience factor, because that, play, that makes them dry, so the farmers can harvest their grain dry. So basically, and the rest of the store, and you look, basically anything that contains grains, wheat, rye and barley, and anything that's baked, anything that's processed, anything that's canned, contains corn, or soy, or grains, or canola, oil, or sugar, 
100% of sugar beets are engineered and sprayed with Roundup. It's the Roundup diet. So the organic label, organic certification are very clear. The organic movement is very clear, but they want nothing to do with genetic engineering technology. And so organic, by definition, is not engineered or sprayed with the herbicide. There is a 1% tolerance level for contamination, but that's still the cleanest food you can find in a store. And I put the natural here because I want all of you to know that natural has no meaning. If you see natural on a packaged food, it means nothing. It could be full of pesticide or engineered ingredients, and it is natural. It's a gimmick from the food industry. And the last thing I say is no change is going to happen, no change will come without your participation. It's going to come from you. The politicians are not going to change anything. As far as they're concerned, it's very safe. No change will come from the regulatory agencies or the government. And so I say, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to your family, talk to your municipal counselors or your doctors, and make sure you all individually talk to your grocery store manager and say, where are your non-engineered ingredients in the store? 20 years ago, there was no organic produce in the store or organic anything in the store. And now they're there everywhere. And if you ask for it, if you demand it, they will appear. And if you're really pissed off, <laughs> let it rip. <laughs> let it be known. Many of you are grandparents, and maybe some of you are parents. <coughs> and I'm told that mothers can be pretty fierce when it comes to protecting the life and the health of their children. She looks like a mom to me. <laughs> if you want more information, if you want to document yourself, or if you need to argue with your neighbors or your family, you can read this publication, GMO Myth and Truth. It's available online on the internet at this website, earthopensource.org. And it's for free. You can download it for free from the internet. And if you don't want to download it for free or read it as a file on your computer, you can pick up a copy at the table in the bag for $10. That's the cost of printing. It was written by, it's a compilation of studies, by, of scientific studies, by a genetic engineer in London who got really fed up with seeing these, these scientific studies coming out of the corporate science community saying that it's okay, it's safe, it's safe, go back to sleep. And when he knew very well, there were a lot of studies showing damage you know, uh, and concern. So he put together this publication. And then it was written in plain English by a science writer. And so you don't need a university education to read this document. It is not technical. And it is easy to read. Thank you very much. Well, wasn't that a wonderful talk? Hmm. We, I'm sure a lot of you will have questions. Dr. Brain can stay around another half hour or so before he goes off to Revelstoke to give another talk there this evening. So if you have questions, I'd ask, I'd ask Reverend Elliot if she would moderate the procedure. Just so you understand, I'm going to try to uh, repeat the question so that uh, there's clarity and, and, and we can hear all of us through the microphone. So raise your voice. Yeah, your question. Thanks so much for all this information. 
Um, what, one of the arguments um, that I've heard for GMO uh, um, is the possible benefits to food quality, particularly in terms of rice, that the, that the insertion of increased vitamin A in rice can alleviate uh, malnutrition in many places in the, on the planet. And could you respond to that? Or? So one of the benefits that you've heard it, in GMO is that it can be an improvement, especially in rice. Especially in places where there's malnutrition. And malnutrition. The, the introduction of enhanced <coughs> vitamin A levels in rice can make a difference for... for you you must have missed my, uh, my remarks in the beginning. I said 90% of all engineered plants are resistant to the herbicide. The technology is about selling a chemical. Everything else is a distraction. And golden rice has been around for 12 or 15 years, I think. And basically, it's not working. It has been around for 10 to 12 to 15 years, and it has not been distributed in the field. It does not work. The level of vitamin A produced in the grain is minimal and has no no ad, gives no advantage in the food to malnourished people. Kids who would eat, would have to eat, I don't remember the numbers, but like 20 pounds of rice every day to get enough vitamin A to survive. That's why I call it a distraction. Is there a documented uh, connection between Bt and colony collapse disease and bees? Is there a docu documented connection between, connection between BT and col colony collapse? Colony bees collapse bees. in bees. Colony collapse disorder, CCD. Uh, we are in serious trouble in North America, even in Europe, <coughs> with this problem where the bees are dying. And I was a beekeeper until this spring when a bear came to destroy my hives. <laughs> so that's a different order. Uh, there is no link between the Bt trait, the proteins, and, and the bees. The link is the insecticide that coats the seeds of engineered plants as well as non-engineered plants. This is industrial agriculture. The insecticides that are used today are called systemic insecticide. You coat the seeds and the whole plant grows and has residues of insecticide which are extremely neurotoxic. They're called neonicotinoid insecticides. And it has been shown that this family of insecticide is incredibly destructive to the bees. So much so that these insecticides are now banned in Europe. But in Canada, we're a little slow. I think it's going to happen. We just need a little bit more time before, before we get it. Yes? I was going to summarize your last six words, okay. <laughs> if I could. <laughs> Go ahead and um, form your question. Why, why do you think that um, there has been such, there has been no successful concerted voice of scientists that are concerned about this? Why is there not a concerted effort and voice to, from the various sides and opinions to from scientists to uh, address this problem? Scientists are kind of shy creatures, generally speaking. And there is no doubt that the biotech industry um, sorry, the words don't come. The biotech industry is definitely um, uh, giving a lot of money to academia as well as to other people. But academia is particularly well treated. There's a lot of research in biotechnology. 
And in the last 25 years, and I saw that when I was still working, in the last 25 years, basically the government and the universities have redu reduced the funding very much. And basically, when I was, when I was in, uh, working for Agriculture Canada, if I received a grant from a company, that meant that it was useful. There was, there was, there, I had a project that was useful because my director, of course, is not really a scientist, doesn't get it. And so if I can say, well, I've got, you know, I've got a million dollars from uh, Monsanto, well, look at me, you know, I'm useful, I'm doing something, but there will be a, a, my project will have an end result at the end. So a lot of scientists in biotech are feeding at the trough. And of course, they, if they do work with the biotech companies, particularly Monsanto, they actually have to sign a research agreement. <laughs> and if you do not sign the research agreement, you do not have access to the seeds or the material, the genetic material that you might need to do your research. So there's a, there has been a complaint by many scientists of, about this uh, process, that basically the scientists are uh, are not free to speak. And then there's the rest of the scientific community, and they don't know how to spell DNA, and they don't have a voice. My opinion. Yes, yes, you're talking about how bad glyphosate is. What about the heather seam that they used to use in the corn crops? Did you get that? Yes, but maybe... Okay. Um, let's say that again. Atrazine. <laughs> okay. He knows what I'm talking about. Atrazine and, and many of the other herbicides are quite toxic, particularly and very residual in the soil. I'm not arguing with that at all. And when I was a graduate student, when uh, Roundup appeared, it was the safest herbicide ever. It, was, it has basically no acute toxicity. It has very little acute toxicity, so the company is very prone to say it's like uh, aspirin or sugar. And it is biodegradable, it disappears from the soil, etc. And it happens that no, it doesn't quite disappear from the soil as fast as they say. But in terms of acute toxicity, you're correct. It definitely is one of the safest herbicides. But it is, has become so prevalent. It is in the air, in the food and in the water particularly in the food. And it is an antibiotic. And we did not know that because when it was registered as a herbicide, the industry said, well, it works on the shikimat pathway, which is a pathway, a, a biochemical pathway in the plants. It impairs an enzyme in that pathway. And that pathway does not exist in animals. Therefore, no toxicity to humans. And now we are revising this, this because we know that it definitely impairs the microbiome, the, the bacteria in our guts. And that's dangerous. Yes, sir. If I interpret everything that you have said this afternoon, this whole argument is redundant. I'm sorry, the, the, the whole, whole argument ar is redundant. Humanity is doomed. <laughs> Humanity is doomed. All living creatures are doomed. You have offered no antidote. There is no antidote. Am I right? There is no antidote. No and? Antidote to this problem. He's wondering. No and to the problem. There is no and to the no problem. And or antidote. No antidote. Yeah. Yeah. Reversal. Well, yes, sometimes I say the gene is out of the bottle. And I also say there is no recall. That's one thing. In terms of, you know, uh, that's what I say. I say, look, this used to be my field of work. 25 years ago, it was safe. It was fantastic technology, and we were going to do wonders with it. And it is useful in the lab. It is very useful in the lab with, you know, if you're working with bacteria or in the medical field or, or to do uh, farming, PHAR, as I said. It can be very useful, but as it has been, I'm going to use a strong word here, hijacked by a chemical company, and as it is used in agriculture today, yes, 
Yes, it is dangerous. It is flawed. It is flawed because we did not know that there would be new proteins created that could be dangerous and be allergenic and toxic. That's published, that's documented, that's public knowledge. And then we are now are learning that the herbicide is actually not just without any acute toxicity, it is an antibiotic, it is patented as an antibiotic. There is no ignoring reality. So in your opinion, if Monsanto and all the chemical companies in the world were to cease and desist this very instant, how many generations is it going to take <coughs> to return civilization or society or living humanity so if all right. of the Monsantos of yeah, our world were to stop to correct now this. to right. correct this, Which how long? Which going to happen, so we're still doomed. Uh, we do. <laughs> okay, I have read, this is anecdotal, but I have read many reports from doctors who over the last many years have been aware of this toxicity problem, and when they get patients in their office with some symptoms that they think they can attribute to glyphosate, they just say, look, you know, you're going organic now. And those people recover very quickly, in a matter of weeks. So, doomed is a bit st a strong word. I am not particularly optimistic that anything is going to change quickly. Because the farming community is a very powerful, after all, we need food. And the technology has been so incredibly successful because of the convenience factor. And as you, this gentleman was pointing, if we don't use glyphosate, well, what, are, what are we going to use now? Atrazine and all these other very toxic herbicides. Maybe industrial agriculture is not exactly the answer. <laughs> On the horizon in Canada, GMO apple <coughs> and salmon. And uh, the comment he made first was that we all can vote with our pocketbooks and buy organic. <coughs> yes, uh, the GM apple is probably coming. It looks like it's uh, coming to be registered probably in 2014. I was in a debate in Kelowna about the apple, and I can tell you about the uh, apple growers, they are chartists, are, are absolutely irate. They are furious. They look like that mother on the screen. <laughs> you know. And the next day we were in Osoyus. I was giving uh, my presentation in Osoyus in the evening and I had one of the regional district directors who came to the microphone after my talk. And he spoke for less than a minute and as he was finishing he was looking exactly like her. He was furious and yelling in the microphone. That, and that's a regional district director. They are beside themselves. I said last night in Canada, you know, we have a little bit of a problem with civil obedience. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? In the future though, is it not possible to plant other varieties again, in as much as that this is a certain genetic expression of say corn, it be possible then to extinct the, the, the contaminated variety that Monsanto has modified so that in terms of food health and in terms of the future, um, except for the possibility that the genes are transferred right across all the varieties, we could go back to older varieties, a different variety that doesn't contain the, the, the gene. Is that not so? You're, you're in non-engineered variety? non -engineered yeah. varieties. Can we go back to... Uh, the old varieties and replant and reverse this process of uh, what's happening now? We're a little bit backward in Canada and in the USA. There are 64 countries in the world who have banned <coughs> genetically modified plants, crops, or regulated them or labeled them, okay? That's for food and the <coughs> crops themselves. Like in France and in Europe, like I told you, the varieties of corn in Europe yield higher without the technology. So yes, of course we can go back 
to newer variety. There are, there are technologies that, um, there are breeding technologies now using micro, mi biotechnology, but not genetic engineering, that allow you to breed much better varieties without using the gene, uh, lateral gene transfer. So yes, absolutely. Uh, my name is Jerry Paquette, and I've interviewed about 15 or so farmers, some of whom are in this room, like Brian here from Cranell Gale, who, are, who love their land, love their crops, stay small. They're the people I buy from. And I would argue, Ed, that uh, probably the solution here, if there's a solution, is to know your farmer, support your farmer, and help them avoid this sort of thing. I think that all of you heard that. But Jerry, <laughs> Dr. Rain has told us all about this gene transfer. Mm -hmm. So even organic crops, people are losing their certification. And yeah. it's in the air. How do we stop it from going from your field to mine? No okay, let's direct the question here this way, please. And I'll ask you to answer that. But we'll step outside. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's like a, a sense okay. like or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's a concern. I came here um, to, to meet farmers and talk about them, and I was looking for those who were growing certified organic crops. That's why I started with Brian, plus he has certified organic beer, in case you didn't know that. Um, I, I found that certified organic isn't all it's propped up to be, pun intended. I, I think what, what I'm learning now, and I may change my mind down the line, is what's more powerful than certified organic is that love and passion for the soil and pure farming that you find among people in this area. And I think ultimately, that so-called grassroots approach is going to be helpful. We've got heroes around the world, like Vandana Shiva, who worked in India against Monsanto, and has fantastic success with it there. And we all need to know what else is going on. You've been tremendously helpful and insightful for us today. So I'd like to ask, if, is your presentation available anywhere? Look at the cameraman down here. It will be on YouTube very soon. Fantastic. The only thing we've all got going for ourselves, really, is our own immune system. And you talked about immune response uh, affected by GMO. Would you just re-explain that for us? The thing we have going for us is our immune system. Can you explain that uh, for us? Much of your immune system is in your microbiome. The bacteria in your guts are responsible for very much of your immune system. You want to protect them. You want to be very caring and careful and very gentle with them. You do not want residues of antibiotic in your food. Excuse me. Jerry Paquette hosts and produces a radio show on the new radio station here in Salmon Arm. CKVS 93.7 FM, the voice of the Shiswa. A nutritional program is quite excellent. I encourage everyone to tune into that. Thank radio you. Program. Another question? I'm interested in the. Can you stand, please, to speak? And I'm interested in the bacteria and everybody else has got. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a neighboring community that spreads their sewage. So he's asking about those who spread the sewage across the land. Does that affect it in uh, harmful ways? You're going very far away from my expertise here. Um, is it real sewage or is it like... Uh, it's treated sewage. It's treated sewage. It's biosolids. Biosolids are what... It, it's the liquid. 
Yeah, okay. But still, it's treated. Municipalities all over North America had a really serious problem getting rid of the sewage. You know, you poo and mine. And everything from the hospital and all the little small industries, everything goes into the same pipe. And then what do we do with it? Until about 20 years ago, somebody realized that actually there's a lot of poo in there, there's a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus. And why don't we put it back on the land? It becomes a fertilizer. And why not? Except, like I said, everything goes in the same pipe. So, you know, your neighbor is on chemo, or the next person over there is on radiation, or the hospital, or the paint uh, store, or everything goes in the same store, in the same pipe. I do not use biosolid, I do not use sewage. And I can't really answer your question. If it's treated, it's supposed to be semi sterile. I'm so. wondering what happens with the, with the chemicals that you're talking about that go into the the biosolid, the biosolids in North America are not analyzed for heavy metals and, and all kinds of other molecules, you know, estrogens. Your, your neighbor is on estrogen therapy. Well, that goes into the sewer, etc. So, so those, that stuff contains all kinds of molecules that you don't want in your field or in your food. That's industrial agriculture. The second part of your question, I think, was to do with the spraying that would, uh, and I think this has been addressed already. Yeah, I was okay. just wondering if it spread, it spread okay. on the neighbor. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know a little bit about GMO-free BC. GMO-free BC. Let's hear a little more. Okay, there is a few people in Vancouver and... Um, growing movement, I suppose you could call that, but the, the core people who are keeping the website going, uh, it's GE Free BC. Uh, <coughs> it's a small organization that the purpose, their, their main purpose is to um, alarm people enough or, or raise awareness enough so that people will actually lobby the councillors and municipal council and the mayor of their municipalities so that they will decide to pass a resolution to create a GE free zone. And so for example, all of you here, you go and really knock on the door and knock on the head of your municipal councillors and say, we absolutely want a GE free, where are we, seminar? <laughs> and, you, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, if there's enough of you, well, it's difficult to ignore. And so, okay, so the council passes a resolution to create a GE free zone. And it, it doesn't mean that the farmers cannot keep growing whatever they please. It means that the people have spoken. The consumers have spoken. And when there is enough of those little bubbles coming up, you know, there's GE free Richmond and GE free Powell River and GE free Saanich and GE free, there's like 22 of them today. This is a recent movement. And the Association of Vancouver Island Communities met in the spring uh, in Souk on the island. And I gave them a presentation somewhat like this, and I must be uh, convincing because they all voted almost unanimously to make Vancouver Island GE free. Mm -hmm. And then the Union of BC Municipalities met in Vancouver in October, and not at, uh, you know, they were not unanimous. I think the vote was about 60 40, but they also decided to pass a resolution to make all of BC GE free. So there's a lot of councillors, there's a lot of mayors who are on your side. They just need a little bit of help, a little bit of convincing, or a little bit of making sure that you're behind them. Is there any 
any progress being made on the labeling of GM, GE containing foods? Any progress on the labeling of uh, GE contained foods? I don't think so. I don't see any. The industry pours a lot of money in the stopping of it. Your grocery store manager, talk to your grocery store manager. There's got one here. That was my question, and so I looked it up, and I followed a long trail of government websites that kept repeating that companies were free to label GMO or non-GMO, but at the end of the trail it said that they had to be proven by a regulatory board, which was not yet formed. So it... <laughs> a search on the internet there there's a long trail of showing that companies are free to label or not label and then they have to be uh, reviewed by a committee that isn't formed yet a regulatory yes. board, regulatory so, they, they board. Okay. so you've given the question and the answer I think you know I have no doubt you are the change if you want something to change you have to do it you can go home and go back to sleep, or do something. I think the last question. There, there's, there's one other thing that we could do, and that is to um, encourage our politicians um, to support scientists who are well-funded and independently funded. You, you referred a number of times to the fact that Monsanto is putting billions of dollars into research funds. Uh, one of the gaps that we have in our society, and especially with the Harper government, with the, you know, there's been a full-out assault on science, um, including Agriculture Canada, uh, where science, we need scientists to give us better and more information. And so this is another thing that could be done, in, in my opinion, is to get more and better information from independently funded um, scientists. And that means uh, the public first, that we support our, our universities and we ensure that our government scientists have a free uh, 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 format for speaking about their, their discoveries. Do you agree? I, yeah, yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I disagree with that. Yeah. <coughs> Sounds like a long haul, because really the last 25 or 30 years, it's what I call academic capitalism. It's like, you know, you, the more money you get from the biotech industry, the more students, the more postdocs, the more papers, Correct. the bigger ego. It's a life. I did, oh. did I mention patenting? When I was a young a student and a young scientist, the game, the name of the game was Publish or Perish. You know, here is your lab, here is your assistant, Here's your budget, don't bother me, just publish a lot. That was it. And then about, as I said, about 20, 25 years ago, it kind of changed. It became patent and get rich. Okay, I did say last question was there. Are you able to answer one more? I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this gentleman has had his hand up. Did you too? Sorry about that. It's uh, atrazine. Um, it was published in Acres USA that they, they, this was a this is peer reviewed scientific. They, they drilled the well. They went to 22,500 wells throughout the United States and found atrazine. Atrazine. Yes, in 95 percent of the wells. In and I say to them, is this brand of like like uh, big boy better boy tomatoes? Monsanto controls 46% of all seeds in North America as we speak. And they're going to squeeze and buy up everybody's companies. And if you go willy-nilly to any store and just buy seeds, you may be buying seven of seeds. So if you want to hit them in the pocket, every dollar that you spend, you can control. When you walk out of here at the grocery store, wherever you go, you shop with your dollar. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's, I know you. It sounds like you might be able to. Thank you. Thank you for reinforcing the comments today. One simple question. Is there a website we can go to to find out if anyone listed which foods in North America are GE contaminated already? 
If you look for, is there a website that you can go to to see what is engineered and what isn't, and what brand and what kind of food is safe, etc.? And I'm sure if you Google this, you know, in many different ways, you will find some website that have those. There's more than one, uh, particularly in the USA. So I don't know if the brands apply here. I'm told there is an app if you are a techie. There is an app, but you can uh, you can scan the barcodes on the products in the store, and it will tell you whether it's engineered or not. I'm not techy, I don't know. So. Okay, I think we'll quit at this. Thank you. Thank you.